Hello and welcome to the CircuitPython weekly meeting for May 24th. My name is Scott and I work for Adafruit on CircuitPython. Uh, this is, uh, <laughs> CircuitPython is a version of Python designed for, to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Uh, Adafruit is an open source hardware and software company based out of New York City who funds a number of us who work on CircuitPython. Uh, so if you want to support uh, Adafruit and CircuitPython, CircuitPython development through Adafruit, uh, please go to adafruit.com and consider purchasing some hardware there. Uh, this meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython, tech dev, CircuitPython dev text channel in the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with the hol U.S. holiday. Speaking of which, uh, next week there is a U.S. holiday on Monday. So next week will be 24 hours later on Tuesday, um, not on Monday. So big flashy lights next week is not on Monday. Um, we'll notify you via Discord. Uh, if you wish to be notified about changes in the meeting, we, we could add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There's also a calendar available that we try to keep updated if you'd like to subscribe to that. I checked it. it the meeting next week is also shifted there. This meeting is recorded. We record the audio from the voice channel and the video of the text channel. If you'd rather not have your voice recorded, you're still welcome to participate. Oh, and I wanted to make sure I had the right tab being recorded. Um, <laughs> the video of this meeting is posted to YouTube and the audio is released as a podcast. If you find this podcast is not available on your favorite podcast service, let us know. Uh, there is a note stock to accompany the meeting and recording. If you wish to participate but can't make it to the meeting, you can leave hug reports and status updates for us in the document and we'll read them off during the meeting. The notes document also contains timestamps to go along with the video so you can use the video the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 60 to 90 minutes so this gives you the option to skip around. A link to the notes document is posted on the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord every week. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc. This meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news. This is a look at all the things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. This is a preview for our Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers separate from what we're all up to. The third part is hug reports. Hug reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is status updates. Uh, status updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to, take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting, and what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. The fifth and final part is in the weeds. In the weeds is an opportunity for more long-form long discussions. These discussions can come out as status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. Uh, if you have topics for in the weeds, please put them in the notes doc under that section along with your uh, username. And that covers how the meeting will go. Uh, with that, I will switch note stocks, take a time code, and do community news. So first up in community news, Python snakes its way to the new Texas Instruments TI-84 plus CE Python graphing calculator running CircuitPython, or a CircuitPython, a version of CircuitPython, not official CircuitPython. Um, the new TI-84 plus CE Python graphing calculator by Texas Instruments runs a CircuitPython fork. Um, we should make that clear. Uh, this link here uh, goes to the USA site and it says you can sign up for alerts but not purchase yet. And this link goes to the UK site and it's available for purchase in the UK. Uh, read more and follow developments as they are known from the Adafruit blog. <laughs> Uh, Hackster.io News discusses the TI-84 plus CE Python calculator, CircuitPython, and available modules there as well. Um, and I just, I'll have to remember to say that it's a fork. Okay. Um, and as far as we know, we haven't seen the source of it either, so it's a private fork at this point, which is totally okay by our license. Although they shouldn't actually be calling it CircuitPython. They should say it's CircuitPython, but not. Yeah. Got to figure that out. Um, okay, next up, more coverage of using CircuitPython drivers on MicroPython on the Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, this is a headline from last week, uh, so more coverage on the headline in the last newsletter. 
on using CircuitPython drivers on MicroPython on the Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, Tom's Hardware had a write-up. It said CircuitPython libraries slither into MicroPython on the Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, mix both MicroPython and CircuitPython code in the same file on a Raspberry Pi Pico with Blinka. Uh, that's uh, from Gurgle Apps on YouTube, I think. And then lastly, uh, Pimeroni has baked uh, the CircuitPython Blinka layer and platform detect libraries into their MicroPython uh, helper library, which I think is actually um, their build of MicroPython um, as well. Next, uh, we had some info around disabling the CircuitPython USB devices in boot.py. Uh, with the upcoming CircuitPython 7X, you'll be able to selectively disable the many USB devices it creates, the CircuitPy drive and the USB serial. Read more uh, in the new guide, Customizing USB Devices in CircuitPython. And there's a link to the Learn Guide and the blog. Uh, there's also example code from Todd Kurt on Twitter and on GitHub. Next, um, Adafruit squeezes the power of the RP2040 into a US USB key. On the desk of Lady Ada, Lamora discusses development of the Adafruit Trinky RP2040 with QD connector. Uh, there's a link to the YouTube there. And thank you. I think it's probably Foamy Guy posting all these links in the chat. Thank you, Foamy Guy. Um, quote, we've wanted to have something that plugs into a USB-A port and provides a QD port for a while. But since we want it to support any and all QD boards, we need more RAM and storage than the SAMD21 can provide. We probably cannot buy any SAMD51s for like a year, but RP2040 is a good option. Lots of RAM and we stuck an eight megabyte flash on there. The idea is you can attach a QD sensor or whatever on top with some nylon standoffs. Maybe it will even auto detect which sensors are plugged in. We made the boot button to user button too, thanks to a little dial diode friend. Uh, and Tom's Hardware uh, reviews the Adafruit QD2040 Trinky as well. Uh, next up, lots of news. Um, Arduino R Nano RP2040 Connect now runs CircuitPython. Uh, Liz, Blitz City w DIY, submitted a PR to add support for the Arduino Nano RP2040 to CircuitPython. So far, so good. The digital pins all toggle right and see the built-in LSM6 DSOX chip on the I2C port. There's a driver for this IMU, so the video has a quick demo. An external OLED wired up on the same I2C bus, reading accelerometer and gyro data and displaying it on YouTube. Next up, uh, the Python Software Foundation has a second quarter 2021 fundraiser. Uh, PyLadies Brazil co-founder Deborah Azevedo can capture her feelings about our Python community in one word, belonging. There's a link to a mail post about it. Deborah has stumbled upon her love for programming accidentally. Quote, I pursued a computer networking course because I didn't want to code, she said. But when I learned Python, I had this empowering feeling that I could really build something. Thanks to community support, the, the PSF has provided more than 651 PyCon scholarships and travel grants to community members like Deborah and $2.8 million in grants to Python projects across 91 countries over the past 20 years. You made this possible. You built this incredible community and sustained it for more than 20 years. You helped us come this far. To continue this growth, the Python Software Foundation needs your help raising $80,000 by June 12th. Uh, to give to the Python Software Foundation, there's a psfmember.org link there. And almost near the end here, we have uh, the 2021 Python Language Summit Lightning Talks Round 1 recovered. Uh, the first day of the 2021 Python Language Summit fin finished with a series of lightning talks from Petter, uh, Victorin, Lorena Mesa, myself, and Jeff Allen. CircuitPython, uh, quote, uh, CircuitPython is a much smaller version of Python that runs on microcontrollers. Scott Shawcroft compared what's included in CircuitPython and CPython to give a sense of what is central to a user's experience of Python. Read more at the PSF blog. And that's it. Uh, as always, this has been a preview of the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. The CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter is a Py CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python and hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, 
Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub by going to github.com slash Adafruit slash CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter and look for the drafts folder with a draft in there. And submit a pull request uh, with your changes. Uh, you may also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com and we'll add it for you. Whew, what a loaded newsletter. I can't imagine how the newsletter is going to be. Thank you to Anne for putting that all together. Uh, next up, we have the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the health of the broader CircuitPython project. And we'll go over some numbers to ground us uh, in, in the stats we like to check out. So first, we'll do overall. Uh, overall, we had 43 pull requests merged from 23 different authors, which is becoming more and more the norm, which is amazing. So thank you to all of our authors. Uh, we had 11 reviewers as well. So thank you to all of our reviewers. As always, reviewers empower our authors. So the more reviewers we have, uh, the better. <laughs> Uh, so if you're interested in reviewing, please reach out to us. We'd love to help you get to that point. Issues-wise, we had 20 closed issues by 10 people and 23 opened by 20 people, so we're net up three, which is not too shabby, and lots of people involved, so that's good too. With that, let me talk about the core. And I forgot to write my overview, but that's okay. Uh, 23 pull requests merged into the core from 16 different authors. Um, a lot of folks I recognize, but uh, some new folks. Edric, I think, is new. Blitz City DIY is new. Gabe Willen is new. Uh, so thank you to those new authors. We had eight reviewers. Thank you to those reviewers. Uh, we have 24 open pull requests, where one of them is over 200 days old. The rest are less than that. Many of them are just a few days old, less than a week, so that's great. Um, that's pull requests. Issues-wise, we had 11 closed issues by 6 people and 11 opened by 9 people, so we're net zero, which is awesome, for a total of 452 open issues. We keep track of how we're doing keeping up with issues by using milestones to triage the issues. Uh, we have 5 active milestones where we have 60 open issues for 7.0. Uh, we're going to have to take a look at those again. And we have two issues not assigned to milestones. So those are the ones that we need to take a look at. Um, not uncommon to have a couple that we haven't looked at because of the weekend. Um, overall, uh, things are going really good. Uh, Dan's been running down the flash issue with the cutie pies. And once that's uh, sorted out, we'll get uh, 6.3 RC0 at the door. And then once that's once 6.3 is stable, we'll start doing 7.0 uh, pre-releases as well. So lots of exciting stuff. And with that, let me kick it over to Katni for the library update. Thanks, Scott. So this is uh, all about the CircuitPython libraries and applies to every library that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as the CircuitPython community bundle. Um, and our cookie cutter uh, that takes care of generating the initial library files. Um, so we had 16 pull requests merged by eight authors and six reviewers. Um, in terms of merged pull requests, we have one that was 113 days old, which is excellent. Um, I will talk a little bit about uh, the fact that those are getting taken care of later. Um, and we're keeping up with some recent ones, which is also great. <clears throat> Um, we had seven, and that leaves us with uh, 50 open pull requests. So we had seven closed issues by five people and eight open by eight people, leaving us with 307 open issues. Uh, six of those are labeled good first issue. Although um, I went through that list and either they're already being taken care of or they're not really that great. So we need to curate that a little better, I think. Um, if you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython, Go to circuitpython.org slash contributing if you're interested in contributing on the Python side of things. Um, you'll find a list of open pull requests, a list of open issues, and a list of library infrastructure issues. You can search the open issues by label, um, or you can search them, uh, you could search for a particular piece of hardware in the page. Um, and if you go through that and you find something that interests you, let us know and feel free to start working on it. Um, we have a guide on contributing to Git and GitHub, uh, or g contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. If you are new to those things, uh, don't let that intimidate you. 
And we are always available on Discord, et cetera, to answer questions. Um, we want you to contribute. So whatever it is that you want to do, uh, we want to help you do that. Um, and in terms of library updates in the last week, we have had uh, no new libraries, but uh, several updated libraries that I won't read off. Um, overall, we are seeing um, a lot of action on older PRs, which is excellent, thanks to Jose David who has been um, going through all of them and tagging folks and getting some of them merged, testing them, that kind of thing. Um, something that we talk about every week that needs to be done, uh, Jose David is taking care of it. So if you submitted a PR, um, expect to see some action on that at some point. If you are waiting on us, please feel free to ping us at any time. Um, give us obviously 24 business hours uh, to reply, but if it's been longer than that, um, you can always tag us again. And uh, that's where we are with libraries. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. Next, let's kick it over to Melissa for an update on Blinka. Hello. So for Blinka, we had uh, four pull requests merged. I see Dollar Star Nova is somebody I don't recognize. Uh, and we had three reviewers. Uh, there are six open pull requests amongst all the Blinka related requests repositories at this point uh there were two close issues by two people and four open by three people leaving a net of 56 open issues there were 7322 pipi downloads in the last week and we are currently supporting 74 boards overall it's great to see um more contributions to blinka and um i think having it expanded to work with micropython once again has helped a lot and that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. All right. Uh, next up, we're done with the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. We're going to go to Hug Reports. Hug Reports is done as a round robin. So uh, I will start and we'll go through the folks in the notes uh, and in the voice channel. Uh, if you're uh, unable to make the meeting, you can always drop notes in the notes doc and I'll read them off. Otherwise, uh, or if you're in the meeting and don't want to speak, go ahead and just say that you're text only and I'll read them off for you as well. Um, okay. So I have two, three hug reports. Uh, first, a hug report to Blitz City DIY for adding board support for the RP2040 Arduino. <laughs> I missed a, my brain's too fast for my mouth. Uh, and Le Samurai Pour Pay uh, for the idea of a, adding a webhook from GitHub status to the uh, channel on Discord for that. And thanks to Dan who set that up. And those are my hug reports. Let's go back up to the top and go to C Grover. Yeah, I've got a hug report for David G for the help and the uh, inspiration, the discussions and ideas that he's provided while I've been going through some thermal camera host board selection uh, performance comparisons. And then I wanted to thank Lady Ada and the team of people that are working on the RP2040 SPI improvements, and I hope to see those spread to a couple of other boards too. Awesome. Thank you, Seagrover. Uh, next up, it looks like we have notes from Blitz City. Uh, Blitz City says, thanks to Naradoc, Mark Gambler, Dan H, Katni, and Tan Newt for their help on Discord. Excellent learn guides and help on GitHub with the PR for the Ar Arduino Nano RP2040 Connect. It was my first time doing something like that, and all of your assistance and documentation made it a sm smooth experience. And of course, thanks to Lady Ada for the cleanup, testing, and merge. Next up is Charles. Yes, I I want to give a hug report to Lady Ada and all the people, all the Circuit Python people who worked on creating the drivers for uh, for the rotary uh, Tranky because that has turned out to be a very handy device for my music projects and a group hug for everybody else. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. All right, next up is Dan. Okay, um, I'd like to thank ADCC on GitHub, who's been uh, helping me debug. Um, we have it, well, just to state the problem, we have some QDPI RP2040 boards that um, 
when you plug them in, Circuit Python doesn't start up, or you have to press reset a bunch of times or something. And it turns out this seems to be due to a slow startup of the crystal oscillator that's on the board. And ADCC was also investigating some issues possibly having to do with the flash memory, but that's probably a red herring. So they were extremely helpful on this, and they've looked at traces, and I've looked at traces. And we, we've come to a conclusion, I think, which is great. I'd like to thank CamTom480, who very quickly tried out um, Dynamic USB on this presence. They support this presence and submitted some fixes because I hadn't had a chance to test its presence at all with Dynamic USB. Thanks for Dave Putz for doing Pulse Out on the RP2040, which was highly necessary. And also repeating thanks to Blitz City for the Arduino Nano RP2040 board definition. Okay. Thanks, Dan. All right, next up is, I have notes from David Gloud, who says, a hook report to Kevin J. Walters for finding a bug present since 5.0 with the I squared C not, is not unlocked with soft reset. Hug report to C. Grover for performance analysis of many boards with a thermal camera. Hug report to Blitz City DIY for the Nano RP2040 Connect PR and Lady Ada for the faster spy screen update. And next, next up is D. Harada. Hey, um, so first I'll report is to whoever wrote the Adabot patch software because that has probably saved me about 50 hours in the last few days. Um, and then a group hug. Awesome. Thanks, D. Harada. Uh, next up is Foamy Guy. Alrighty, thanks. Uh, first hug goes out to NearDoc. Uh, pointed me in the direction of the, the 7.0 bundle. I was grabbing individual uh, libraries one at a time. I didn't realize there was a bundle there, so that helped me out a lot. Uh, to Les Samurai Porpe, um, pointed me towards in the uh, community bundle, there's a base 64 library that can encode and decode. Um, so thank you for that. To Brent and JW Cooper, uh, both helped me with some questions I had about Adafruit IO. And uh, last one for me is uh, to Kmatch, uh, Mark Gambler and KJW, uh, and possibly some others as well, who all looked into and did testing and um, uh, testing and uh, worked up a, a fix for an issue on uh, fun houses with the display uh, drawing some weird extra pixels. And uh, possibly I think it is on other ESP32 S2 devices as well. Uh, but fun house was the first one reported. So thanks to all those folks. Thanks. Thanks, Foamy Guy. And uh, Katni points out in the chat that Summersoft is the author for the Ada Patch software stuff, we believe. So, hug report to Summersoft specifically. All right, next up we have notes from HireEffect, who is missing the meeting today. Uh, thank you to Phil B for fixing the Big Sur Drive Eject alert problem, and Doctor on Discord for pointing me to the fix. Uh, thank you to Tanoot for a discussion. Thanks to Armstrong Sabero for work on the H7 analog support. And Tandy again for the LED revamps, and Dan H for the review or reviews. And now I have notes from Jeff E. Uh, I keep deleting the wrong things. Uh, Jeff says hug reports Tandy and Katney for running the meetings and a group hug. Uh, next is Jerry. Jerry. Uh, hi there. Excuse me. Um, yeah, thanks to uh, Maker Melissa for the getting Blinka all going on the MicroPython and, um, the, and the new guide, and for the guide for using uh, the Home Assistant on Funhouse, uh, having fun with both things, and a group hug, everybody. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Cat. All right. Uh, next up, we have notes from Jose David, uh, who says. Uh, hug report to the Samurai Prope for the work in the community bundle and their attention to details. Hug report to Jerry N for helping t me test the PR for the TCA 9548A. Hug report to Tanute for all the week long discussion over libraries memory allocation for the M0 restricted memory board. And a hug report to Maker Melissa for quickly solving issues with Blinka for MicroPython and all the work there. Next up is Katni. All right, my first hug report is to you, Scott, for hosting today so I could get settled into my office without worrying about fighting with OBS and recording the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, to Keith EE e. for joining the PyCon 2021 CircuitPython Sprints this year. Um, they uh, 
were um, super excited to join. They had made a goal of um, contributing to CircuitPython sometime this year and didn't expect to get to it until much later. So they were very excited to have the opportunity. And um, it was they chose to work on an issue that uh, applied to a project that they're also working on. So they had some some personal connection to uh, the thing that they decided to do. And so that was uh, really excellent to help them out and see how that uh, goes. And they're also really looking forward to contributing to the project in a bunch of different ways, including reviewing, um, which I'm looking forward to uh, the time when we can add them to the review team when they're comfortable with that. Um, I also have a hug report for Jose David for going through all the open PRs and making headway towards getting caught up and a group hug to the community. Keep being amazing. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up is Kmatch. Hey, thanks, Scott. Uh, first off, thanks to uh, Gamblor, Anecdata, and KJW for the discussion on the ESP32 spy display issues. So I'm learning a lot uh, tagging along with that issue. Uh, and then the uh, second one is for Lady Ada for the cool... Uh, I squared C UART debugging tool. Looks like it'll be really helpful. Thanks a lot. Ah, thank you, Kmatch. And next up, we have notes from Keith the EE, who says, uh, Hug report to Katni for being fantastic through the sprint and having a great set of demos ready that helped talk about her experience with CircuitPython as a whole. Hug report to Neurodoc for all the help, all of their help in the Python Discord to answer questions in the microcontrollers channel and the community at large as a whole for being welcoming and encouraging and helpful when issues arise. Next up is Maker Melissa. Ah, looks like I'm already unmuted. Uh, let's see, I want to give a report to Jerry for testing out my MicroPython guide. Uh, another one to Jerry for general guide improvement suggestions. Uh, a hug to See, I'm not sure you pronounce this. Uh, Les Papre for fixing the Funhouse slider code. Uh, Ash from Tom's Hardware for writing a great article on Blink and MicroPython functionality. Gurgle Apps for a great YouTube video version of my MicroPython guide and a group hug to everyone else. Awesome. Thanks, Melissa. And next up, we have notes from Mark Gambler. Who says, Hug Report to Kmatch98, Kevin J. Walters, and many others for helping on the ESP32 S2 display glitch problem. Last up, we have notes from Naradoc. Uh, who says, Les Proufe, helping out with the PR to support the new MPY format in Circup. And a Hug Report to Entol and Carlos Perat for f following up on the fixes in the Mu Editor's CircuitPython mode detection. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. So that was Hug Reports, uh, first of two round robins. The next round robin we're going to do is uh, Status Updates, which is a chance for us to talk about what we've, what we've been working on and what we plan on working on in the coming week. It's a really good way to uh, kind of collaborate with folks and, and give tips or tricks about what people are working on. And also just have an idea of everything that's going on with, as our community gets bigger and bigger. So for me, uh, my goal is to be heads down on the BLE workflow stuff. I started it last week. Um, I also finished the status LED stuff. So if you're using the latest on main, you'll see that. I fixed safe mode on the RP2040 for... Um, both 6.3 and 7. So you should be able to enter safe mode by pressing reset multiple times. Uh, of course, that doesn't really work on the Pico because there's no reset button, but if you manage to just do it there, you could. I'm taking Friday and Monday off for the long Memorial Day weekend here in the US, so I'm excited for that. And uh, as a result, deep dive will be on Thursday. Um, one thing I'm going to do today is I'm going to start a deep dive role so that I can ping people about that if they want to know when I switch things up. So uh, that's on my to-do list as well. And with that, let me scroll back up to the top and kick it over to C. Grover for status updates. Well, let's see. Um, I've been spending a little bit of time with the thermal camera, obsessed with trying to get it to work properly. And uh, using some of David G's um, interpolation code, I was able to increase the resolution from 8 by 8 to 15 by 15. 
I got a picture coming up here. But I also wanted to pick a platform for it. So I tried it on seven different development boards, Pipe Portals, RP2040, the Feather S2, and so forth. And um, some of them have integral displays, some without. And um, because of the mix of the I2C and SPI connections, the ULAB methods that we're using inside of that, and it has a really memory-hungry implementation of display I.O. that has over 240 different elements, one for each of the temperature sense uh, displays. It, it was uh, difficult to find just the right kind of host development board for it. So I found that the Pi badge, the Pi Gamer, performed the best for that camera application with the mix of the I2C and SPI and display I.O. requirements. But I was surprised to find that the RP2040 and the ESP32S2 Feather S2 were a lot slower and were unable to achieve my target rate of two frames per second. So I've got a comparison graph I'll show in the in the weeds section just for the information. I know that the thermal application, the thermal camera application is fairly unique in its need for, uh, like I said, I, I2C for the thermal sensor and SPI for the display. So I don't think it's a good board comparison benchmark um, for general purpose applications, but it is kind of interesting to see uh, how some of these uh, development boards work with that. Anyway, for next week, I'm going to um, look at, at updating the existing thermal camera learning guide with some new code, particularly the um, pseudo color spectrum helper that that I developed for that, um, that uses the iron spectrum. It makes the images a lot easier to spot and, and some of the um, edges of the objects easier to spot. Hmm. Then I'm gonna try some of David G's 3X and 4X interpolation techniques. He's done some really great work with the larger sensors and see if I can get rid of the display IO rectangle uh, memory um, usage issues that I've been facing. And then I'm going to find some uh, high quality and affordable servos that may be uh, difficult to do but for the robotic cuckoo clock after about six months the uh, internal bird got a case of laryngitis and we need to fix that oh and finally um the book that i provided some illustrations for is going to the printer this week so that's kind of exciting awesome well thanks so much c grover uh next up is dan Okay, so as I mentioned, um, we have this problem on a small number of Cutie Pie 20, RP2040 boards and maybe some other boards. Um, some people have found that the board doesn't start up properly on power up. And um, so I spent a while looking at this and took some traces with my salier. And uh, this person, ADCC, also worked on this. And it seems like the crystal oscillator is not starting up properly. ADCC saw that. They looked at the waveform and it's a, kind of a mess. It's like not, uh, it's too fast for a while until it stabilizes, for instance, which causes uh, bad data to be read from the spy flash or not any data read. And that's why it's, it, it hangs. So if we just slow down the startup, it works. We have to figure out how to, the best way to do that in a general way, but we can do it easily for 630 right away. Um, I'm starting to work on a um, some kind of keyboard matrix library, which you could use for like simple things like telephone keypads, but also for keyboards. And um, I'd be happy if you have any input on that to hear what your requirements are. It'll probably be something simple to begin with, maybe kind of like gamepad but more general um but and i'll talk to deshi poo about it uh when he comes on uh now that we have the fix for um uh the the the, the startup problem i talked about i will try to get a 630 rc0 out right away and the only other thing i'm going to add is the arduino rp2040 connect board so we'll have a release candidate out and soon after that, if it seems okay, then we'll have a 630 final. And then as soon as that's out, um, I'll work on a 700 alpha release because 700 is in good enough shape that we should have an alpha release for now. But I can't have two 
alpha release. I can't have two um, non-stable releases at the same time, unfortunately. CircuitPython.org doesn't show that, which maybe is something we should fix. But uh, right before we do that, I'll, uh, barring that, I'll, I'll use this timetable. OK. That's Thanks, it. Dan. All right. Uh, next up, we have uh, notes from David Cloud, who says, no project done this week. Although it sounds like he was involved with the uh, the thermal camp stuff. All right. Next up is D. Harada. Um, so last week, uh, up until today, I was running three Adabot patches um, and finishing up the Funhouse IoT Hub guide, just waiting on some issues with the Learn repo. Um, and this week, um, writing code for three guides and actually writing one guide. Um, I'm going to try to start moving the CircuitPython libraries from master to main. Um, hopefully it'll be this week, but it might be next week. Uh, and then I'm also going to be making my own USB cables. Awesome. Thanks, D. Harada. All right, next up is Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, last week I made a PR in the cookie cutter to handle uh, library names with spaces in, in them better. So it will go through and replace with underscores and dashes in all the spots that need it. Um, and then uh, after that, I spent probably the, the majority of the rest of my time uh, last week uh, learning about Adafruit IO and uh, MQTT. And uh, I only done very basic stuff with Adafruit IO before, and I had never used MQTT before. So uh, I got figured out how to post data into Adafruit IO and make dashboards to see it and how to subscribe to feeds with CircuitPython code so that you can get a callback whenever there is new data. So that stuff was all really fun. Super impressed with how uh, easy it is to make kind of dynamic um, IoT projects that can store anything you want up there and notify you when there's new data. It's a really powerful uh, platform. Um, I kind of put most of what I learned to use uh, in order to integrate um, Design.io into Adafruit.io's webhooks so that when a user saves their design, uh, if they have it set up, then it will automatically upload that image to Adafruit.io. And then uh, if they have the receiver code running on a funhouse, it will go ahead, uh, it will get notified of the new version and it will download it and show it on the screen. So it's kind of an automatic update loop whenever you save a uh, design. Um, for this week, I'm going to get that uh, Design.io um, uh, deployed out to a public-facing server. Right now, it's just on my test device. Um, so I'll get that out there this week for other folks to use. And then uh, dive back into the CircuitPython uh, org repos, uh, all the renaming and moving of the Display.io stuff into there. So that's what I'll be uh, working on this week. Thanks. Thanks, Foamy Guy. All right, next up, we have notes from Higher Effect. Who says, last week, reviews and alarm merges and debugging pin alarm on the RP2040. This week, wrap up RP2040 alarm, clean up the NRF alarm, and work on the next file PR. And now we have notes from Jeff Epler, who says, last week, vacation. This week, back on Tuesday, debugging crashes with the Wi-Fi or RGB matrix on ESP32 S2, probably. And next up is Jerry. Uh, let's see, last week, um, I spent a little time playing with the TCA9548, um, just trying to help with testing out a PR. That was kind of fun. Um, I looked and thought I recognized the, the name, so it turned out I bought one in 2017. It's been sitting in a drawer since then, so it was nice to actually pull it out and put some headers on it and put it to use. And um, and I made some uh, soil monitors. I'll pull the picture here and uh, put it in the, in the garden. And um, they um, just to help keep track of the soil. And, and they, they're using the SP32S2 to, to connect back to uh, my home assistant and uh, eventually set it up so that it can ping us when the, when the uh, thing needs, needs to be watered. But it's kind of fun to play with. And um, then I just tested out. Blink on the uh, Pico MicroPython and uh, got the I2C example working okay. I tried it on the SP8266, but it ran out of memory right away. I'm not sure it's worth spending a lot of time and effort on, on that. But I really wanted to use it on, his, on the ESP32, but it's not supported yet. So um, be looking into that at some point. But following up on that, I one of the things I want to be able to do be nice to be able to use some of their RFM radio boards with uh, ESP32s 
And um, I totally forgot that sometime last year in August, I had helped somebody port over the libraries so they actually run them like a Python. And I don't remember I, how far it went and they work. I actually did a quick test and they actually function. So um, I need to go back and do some more looking at that. There's some links and the thing to, to the um, guides, I mean, to the person who was actually setting up the MicroPython library. So that might actually be fun to do. And I'm going to spend a little more time looking at the, the, the rotary encoder seem to have an issue where it can lose some counts if you tweak it just the right way. And uh, I think this was reported by Jeff last week. And uh, I did confirm that it happens on both Arduino and CircuitPython. It's, it's you know clearly something in the in the seesaw itself. But um, then that makes sense since all libraries do is read the data from the seesaw. And next week, yeah, so I want to dig back out all that stuff about MicroPython and the RFM boards and see if I can get those working with my ESP32s. Awesome. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. Uh -huh. All right, next up is Jose David, who says, last week, open PRs and reviews, some library documentation and library features improvements, uh, did some sensor library PRs, and did some testing on the Pico with MicroPython. This week, PRs, PR reviews, and work in the BME280 memory analysis. I think it's E. Might be P. <laughs> uh, next up is Katni. Yeah, I can never remember which one of the BME or P's are, <laughs> but they are. Right. Um, so last week started with finishing up the sprints. Um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, it was great helping um, Keith, the EE, uh, work on the stuff that they wanted to work on. And it gave me some time to work on starting the refactor of the LED animation library. Um, I still don't know what that's going to look like. I'm trying to preserve backwards compatibility to the greatest extent possible. Um, it still will involve, obviously, changing the imports, which means importing another library, um, which, uh, once the library screenshot generator is in place, um, is a much less uh, huge fix to make across you know 28 guides um so i'll be waiting on on that before we actually move forward with this but at the same time it's not really a priority so it may actually just be waiting until i have time which is an indefinite amount of time i worked on the neo trinky guide uh, i don't recall if that went live or not but it, the core of it is mostly done or the core of it is done um, we ran into some issues on the repository that we host all of the learn code on. So I have to fix how the code is embedded in the um, guides. That's seamless to the user, though. Anybody reading the guide is not going to know the difference between how... Um, actually, that's not necessarily true. Um, the, the project bundle download works a little bit different when the code's embedded versus when it's embedded from GitHub. However, all the library is necessary are built into CircuitPython for the Neo, Neo Key Trinky, rather. Um, and so it, it doesn't matter. Um, I did some pretty pins diagrams for a couple of the Trinkies, uh, the Neo Trinky and the Neo Key Trinky. So those are both now available. Um, and the CircuitPython and Python page for the I squared C rotary QT um, already existed, but was not made live until last week. Um, so this week, uh, the last thing for the Neo Key Trinky guide is adding uh, applicable templates. Um, that won't be too bad because there's not a lot to the Neo Key Trinky, so not all of the templates apply. Um, and then next, I'll be working on the Rotary Trinky guide, um, which will involve creating a new template uh, for Rotary encoders. Um, and then after that, will be the slide trinky, and so I'll be doing a, a template there too um, for analog input uh, and potentiometers. Um, and then finally, uh, if I have more time, working on more pretty pins um, for SAMD21 boards. Um, the way pretty pins works, it requires having a um, CSV in place with all of the uh, pins available for a particular chip. 
and the uh, SAMD21 um, has been put together. So uh, that's the next set of them that we're working on, and there's many, many, many. So um, we'll be working through those, and that's where I'm at. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. All right, next up is KMatch. Hey, thanks, Scott. Uh, so this week, uh, mainly I've uh, been doing some testing on some of the fixes that Mark Gambor had proposed on the SPI display fixes for the ESP32-S2. It's an issue that cropped up with some display glitches, uh, particularly observed on the Funhouse board. And that'll be discussion more in the weeds of how to proceed with that. Uh, also, I, I was able to build uh, some code uh, to use the RP2040 as a logic analyzer. It's a project called Pico Logic. Uh, the most recent code I'm running is from a user called Mark a B139, I think is the name, on GitHub, who extended some of Gambler's code. Uh, it's basically a logic analyzer using the 2040, which is pretty good. And uh, I'm trying to make it so my tiny logic friend um, uh, driver for SIGROC and PulseView can also utilize uh, that board as well. So uh, just got a brief update for you. I haven't gotten any response on my PR for that uh, tiny logic friend driver into SIGROC. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping maybe I can test this one out. And if I can get that all into one, maybe we'll have a package of a couple of things so I can make sure it can accommodate that when it goes in. So cool. hope to get that done this week. Awesome. Okay, thanks. Thanks, KMatch. All right, uh, next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. So last week I figured out some ways to get uh, Blinka minimally installed on MicroPython, um, and I wrote a circuit Python libraries on MicroPython guide for the Pico. Um, I worked on getting the BeagleBone Star 5 up and running, but didn't get much further than that. I updated the dynamic bundler to work with 7.x MPY files. I went through circuitpython.org board all the boards on there and did updates like uh, updating images and adding a couple of boards. And I did some general GitHub issue maintenance. This week, I am working with uh, finding developers to make micro Python Blinka install smoother. I'm looking into a new issue that's, or I want to look into a new issue that's causing learn guide peers to fail on some boards and uh, some more GitHub issue maintenance. And that's it so far. Awesome. Thanks, Melissa. Next up, we have notes from Mark Gambler, who says, last week, the ESP32 S2 display glitch related to SPI DMA, and this week, we'll continue looking at the display error. And last up, we have notes from Naradoc, who says, last week, I filed a PR to CIRCUP to fix reading the module version strings in the new MPY format. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> uh, bug fixes and issues to the core, mostly discovered thanks to the help channel. And this week, working on adding the community bundle to CIRCUP in a generic way as a stepping stone to add support for third-party bundles. And uh, also open a couple of REPL-related issues I have filed in the I'll look into it later bin. Perfect. That's exactly what issues are for. The I'll look into it later bin. All right. Thank you so much for everyone's status updates. Uh, we're going to go to our final section here in the meeting, which is in the weeds. Um, there are a number of topics in here already, so you've got uh, some time if you want to add some more things here. Uh, if you have more things to talk about, please just put your name and a brief summary of what you'd like to talk about, and we'll go down the list. So, starting with a topic from Jose David, who said, uh, We'll need some help understanding why we have problems with the RP2040 and not other boards. Uh, regarding a pull request on the TCA 9548A. Um, is anybody aware of this and wants to summarize it? Um, yeah, I was working on that with them. That's just somebody else who wants to jump in. I think it's all you, Jerry. Okay, yeah. So um, I, I wasn't really clear on what the initial problem was, but but when 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 you run the... The, the code there's some, there's a, there was an issue with a try lock that was um, in in missing from the scan program so I think that's what the PRs were uh, trying to fix but and and the fix that was put in works fine on the um, NR52 um, on the uh, on an NR52840 board and on a Feather M4 but when you run it on the um, 
RP2040, it it just doesn't, it, it gives really bizarre results. Sometimes it works, actually. Um, the scan doesn't work. Um, it never reports the right information. But sometimes the actual I2C devices work. And sometimes they don't. It doesn't recognize them. Doesn't it? Doesn't find them. Says they're 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 not there. So there's just hmm. clearly something very odd about about the RP2040. And 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 but the RP2040 works fine if I just plug the devices into into I2C and run them normally without without the MUX the uh, hmm. PCA board. So it's some interaction between the two. It's not at all clear what or why. Interesting. I feel like. Sorry. I was to say, I think Carter has a lot of background with that chip, too. Yeah, he does. He was. Um, in fact, I think he wrote the driver. <laughs> okay. I have no insights right now, but I'll take a look at it. Yeah, I took a look. I mean, the, the, the driver's really. There's not much there. Um, because it all it does is reads from the board um so it is but there's some, there is some funky stuff going on with switching channels and with um yeah uh, maybe it's getting something's getting lost it communicates to it it seems it just doesn't um uh, yeah um, yeah we, we the i squared c issue we had on the 2040 before was having to do with like the data line delay setting or something but I thought we fixed that. But it doesn't also surprise me that there's more issues. Yeah. Yeah, like I did. I, I took. I was working with two sensors on the on the mux, and they they you know it wouldn't it wouldn't see them or it would see them in the wrong channels and also everything. But if I plugged them directly in, they were stemmas, so I just plugged them right into the board, and they worked fine. The uh, both of them recognized both very well. Oh, you're saying it had to do with the wiring? No. No, no. I mean, if you if you if you connect the TCA board and then connect the two I I to C but devices to the um, TCA board, it, it won't work, or it's very unreliable. But if you hook them directly to the to the STEMI connector and just run them normally without the MUX, it, it works fine. Through the the expander, I should say MUX. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. All right. So it's not there's no there's no general I to C problem with with I squared C with accessing two devices, but if you connect them through the multiplex or the the TCA whatever you call it board, um, then it just doesn't recognize things correctly passing through that board. You could just try it with Bitbang I O just to see whether. Oh. Probably yeah. it'll work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, yeah, we we thought we fixed all the I2C issues. For now, there's one more thing that is not fixed that is kind of we're waiting for something in upstream, but it's much more obscure. Yeah, like I said, uh, I I can't blame it on I2C from the testing that I did. It, that that seems to be working fine. So there seems to be some interaction with I2, with with using the the the, the TCA9548 board or driver in. in. But only on the RP twenty forty. Yeah, weird. I got I got nothing. All right, let's move on. Right, let's move on. Thanks, Jerry, for chiming, Thanks, Jerry, in, on for chiming in on it. Sure. So let's go to C Grover. Well, I talked a little earlier about um, trying to find a a host development board for this thermal camera project and some of the trade-offs that are required to make that work memory trade-offs and i2c and spi performance trade-offs so i went to my um, inventory and pulled out whatever boards i had and and started playing with those and i've got a comparison graph coming up here that i'm going to walk through just a little bit what i found was that um, when i tested the pi badger which is at the bottom of this chart, you can see that the data acquisition time, um, the time it takes to interpolate, which is just about invisible on there, it's just a, a millisecond or two, and, and the, the display in gray and the display update time in orange 
is pretty reasonable and it beats my two frames per second target, which is that green line in the center of the graph. And so I started checking other boards that had, most of them had integral displays like the Pi portals and they work pretty well as well. Um, but when I moved up to the Clue, the, um, I don't know if I can read my own graph here. Oh, the Titano, of course the Titano has a big display, so it's gonna have decent data acquisition time for the uh, sensor, but it has a, a huge data uh, or a display update time. But then when I moved to the uh, Feather S2 and the RP2040, I noticed that the acquisition time, which is predominantly I2C, and the display update times in gray and orange were just huge by comparison. And these are these are chips with a lot of memory and with um, a high clock speed. So I was pretty surprised to see that for this particular application, uh, running Circuit Python, that they were just dramatically slower than the M4 that uh, we were using with the Pi Badger. Now the code for acquisition, the code for display updates is, well, acquisition is identical. The code for interpol interpolation is identical. The display code was a little bit modified depending on whether I could use a touchscreen interface on the um, Pi portals, which actually added some display I.O. elements, or if I had to use uh, digital in out for the buttons that I needed for hold and, and focus. So I, if, if you're asking why do you think that is, I have a couple guesses for you. Well, I would love to hear why. I'm mostly just saying, look at what I found here and... Um, is this an indication of something we need to take a look at? I I generally think no. I think what I would expect to see is that it would scale with display size generally. Um, but I think one thing that people don't give enough credit to, at least on the S2s, is that the RAM is on a separate chip. So like RAM, you have a lot of RAM, but it's not fast RAM. It's slow RAM, right? Like uh. um, you're doing essentially spy to another chip for every RAM tra transaction. And that we put we put the whole CircuitPython heap on the S2 there. So like even though the CPU is fast, like the RAM is, is not necessarily fast enough to keep up. Um, so if you're doing RAM intensive computation, you're going to be slowed down by that. Um, the RP2040 surprises me a little bit, but then again, uh, if you're doing any sort of floating point, you're going to hit that. And then on top of that, the RP2040, all its code is also stored externally. Like there's a cache in front of it, but if you're doing lots of different things of code or you're like, you're, you're running enough code that like the cache is full. Like you could be slowing down due to due to that as well. Um, yeah, but I'm surprised that the I2C speed is quite a bit slower than the M4 on both of those because the code is really compact in that area and it's largely just the the time that it takes to pull uh, 64 temperature measurements from the uh, through the Stemma interface. Uh, so I'm surprised at those. Yeah, I think I think the best way to to compare those would actually be just like logic analyzer traces, um, because that would tell. Yeah, you, I planned on scoping it later today. Like that'll tell you what is the clock rate when you're actually acquiring data. Things that can happen is that if we're doing DMA but the DMA can't keep up, you'll see you'll see pauses between each byte, um, and then you'll also mm -hmm. see the between the reads you'll see like transaction time so like how long all the code around an i squared c transaction takes and potentially like i guess i'm thinking of spy but like in spy like you might see like the cs line is like changed quite significantly differently than when the actual like bytes get gets transferred and things like that so i think i think logic mm -hmm. analyzer traces will give you more insight into that piece of the puzzle um, ah, excellent. Okay. Uh, if you want, if you want to dig further, but again, like I tend to, I tend to not. Um... Oh, David says, is there any be benefit in display disabling display auto update? Um, 
There could be. If oh, you... I tried that. I did try that. You did? And I tried that during acquisition. I didn't try that. Actually, I tried it during acquisition, and I tried it um, during calculations, and I and updated it just at the end of after all the calculations were done. And um, it made almost no measurable distance difference. Yeah, so I would say that if you're if you're changing the elements on the screen, and you're changing them in a way that they might overlap, then you're probably transmitting more than you need to if you're doing auto updates. Um, because what mm -hmm. it's good if it's on auto update and you're starting to change the objects on the screen, like it'll start transmitting those, and that's okay if the bounding boxes for each of those individual things are are like separate and not the overlapping. But the moment that you overlap, you're going to end up doing like multiple transitions of the same pixel potentially. Um, so and I, I turned this, but I turned it off and did, didn't really notice any okay. any difference, nothing measurable anyway. Right. So uh, you know, I, it looked to me like for this application, you know, this application is unique, and I recognize that. Mm -hmm. But for this application, um, turning that off really didn't make any big difference. Well, I think that's good then. <laughs> that that tells me there's not a bug yeah, in like fact, the dirty think... area tracking or anything. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I think Display IO Auto Update really works well. I you know I I remember it before um, that got fixed a, a few iterations ago, and this is just wonderful by comparison. Awesome. Well, yeah, I th I think that's interesting. I think you could you could also scope the or logic analyze the display transmits as well to get get an idea of of how that's doing it. Um, you know, bigger areas will be faster to update out. as well. Um, yeah, I, 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 that's obviously true because when you look at things like the Titano um, that has exactly the same architecture as the other Pi portals, it it's a lot slower because it has to do, a, you know, in the, it's a lot slower in the display I.O. section of this, the orange section. Right. That's pretty obvious. Yeah, I mean, anyway, some of it just comes yeah, out of the pixel I'll count. scope the, well, David, and David G says, scope the I2C and then the SPI. That's, you know, in, in the plans. Plus, I, I've, I've been getting some uh, encouragement to try vector uh, I.O. and uh, that may that that could help with some of the screen update stuff, but but I'll tell you, uh, going through this process has been kind of interesting. But um, I was really just trying to pick a host platform for the <laughs> application so I could move on to my next project. <laughs> yeah. And it looks like the Pi Badger might be the winner, but I do like the the touch interface on the Pi Portal, so yeah. that's kind of cool too. Well, this is the danger of performance work is that you, it never is done. Oh yeah, I don't want to go down that particular rabbit hole, but we'll we'll see who can control that, me or or my calendar. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for doing the the analysis. All right. Well, thanks. I, I appreciate you guys letting me bend your ear on this stuff, and and uh, any other advice you have for me, just keep it coming. No, I think I think generally the the story of clock rate is not everything is is important. Yeah, that's why I was surprised by it, because I'm kind of a neophyte when it comes to uh, throwing these applications at these advanced, so-called advanced um, architecture boards, and uh, it's always a trade-off. Yeah, yeah, like the M4s, M4s have the built-in floating point, and that can really help when you're doing math that involves floating point. Um, it, it's pretty amazing. Um, when I plug an M4 into the f uh, TFT feather wing, versus the uh, RP2040, you, you can see just an instant difference, and it's running exactly the same code. Hmm. Yeah, it would be kind of curious to see if, like, we could de... Like, if there's any floating point math in display I.O. that we could find and make integer math instead, instead that could be kind of interesting as well. But those are the yeah, that might performance be. weeds. That can that can be your rabbit hole to go down. No, How's thank that? you. No, thank you. <laughs> um, all all right. right. Well, thank you. Thanks, C. Grover. All right. Uh, next up is Mark Gambler. Hello. Hello. Uh, so an update on what I've found on the Funhouse and ESP32 displays. 
so I, I did all the, uh, what was sort of suggested of switching the command and data rates, and that did not make a difference. Uh, so I didn't want to proceed changing the API until it was sort of further down. And then it was just on a hunch. I disabled DMA transfers, and then it started working. So at this point, I'm just kind of bringing this up because I've kind of hit a limit. I've gone through all the ESP32 S2 examples and their, uh, the IDF for it, and can't see what's different in CircuitPython from what they're doing as to why this might be causing an issue when it is DMA versus uh, non-DMA. The I'm idea, sure the right. IDF is DMAing as well. Yeah, well, and the calls, the calls to it check if you set a DMA flag, and there's basically two lines different. If you call the DMA, it um, it just sets it up versus just tells the low level call to copy it byte by byte otherwise. Right. Yeah, so it's one of these things that I'm not sure if it's better just to lower the the frequency to avoid the glitches in the short term and just keep this issue open. Yeah, that's probably the best place to start. Yeah, I, I'm kind of at a loss. I'm going to keep poking at it a bit, but short of trying to recreate it in a standalone uh, application outside of CircuitPython, I'm not quite sure where else. Um, I could try to use Raspberry Pi. The Pico is a logic analyzer to see if I can get anything, but I'm not really familiar mm -hmm. with that sort of work. So. Yeah, I think this might be the sort of thing that maybe Jeff would be a good person to pick it up. Because uh, I think my, my intuition is to like put a salier on it and compare between the two. Like figure out which byte's being corrupted. Yeah, and that's where I was kind of thinking yesterday. And then I just lacked the equipment to go further. So. Yeah, because DMA can have problems where like your code continued because like the DMA said it was finished but like the peripheral hadn't actually finished transmitting like that sort of stuff can happen um where is it like the timing might be different for the like push each byte by itself i yeah, wonder I, point. I wonder if that's actually the case because like if you look at the push byte by byte code it's gonna have a, a a thing that's saying like while it's not busy or if it's not busy transmitting, then push a new byte, something like that. And it's possible that you want that check at the end of the DMA uh, transmit as well. Yeah, it copies it into the hardware buffer, byte by byte, and the DMA just sets up the uh, linked list descriptor for the DMA. Right. Um, and then most of the rest is just checking, like when you start, it's just setting a hardware register to go. Right. But you're going to block on the DMA finishing, right? Well, and After it does that. block in, uh, the circuit in SPI.C. Right. But I wonder if it, if it's blocking on, if it's blocking on the DMA finishing, it may not be waiting long enough to let the peripheral finish transmitting the byte. The DMA is finished, but the peripheral is not. Right. Right. So maybe, maybe we actually need to wait for the DMA and then wait for the peripheral and then return. Like that might be a hunch. Like I had a similar problem on the RP2040 with the NeoPixels because like, oh, I, I buffered the next four bytes and the DMA is finished, but I've got to wait for the PIO to chew through those four bytes before it's actually finished. Um, otherwise I like shut the perver off too early. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that makes sense. I can poke at it or again, if, uh, if you steps back and he wants to get the background, just. Yeah, if you want to, but like you're totally in the weeds. Thank you for trying what I suggested and feel free to hand that off to, to Jeff. Uh, he'll be back tomorrow. So, okay. 
Sounds good. Yeah, thank you for doing that. No problem. It's interesting. I learned something new, so. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> a lot of new things, but okay, thanks. Cool. Uh, all right, uh, last up we have Dan. Um, so I just, if, if anybody has some ideas about uh, keyboard scanning, and we're talking about different kinds of key, anything with push buttons, not just no, you, typing yeah, yeah. or a music keyboard or something. Right, key matrices. Key matrices, yeah. So let 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 me know. Uh, um, I will ask Radomir also, who's not on today, but we already some something already came up in the chat. So we'll That's all. Yeah. Can? Yeah. I'd be very interested in in, in obser either observing or trying to help with this because I'm I'm trying to put together a. Uh, a, like a 61 key uh, keyboard for uh, my mi for, uh, multiple 61 key keyboards for uh, for my uh, computer uh, computerized organ. Okay, and so if you have if you have some idea about other I do have a couple of ideas on that. Scan eight by eight matrix uh, eight by eight matrices. Yeah, so let if you if you have some idea of what you'd like the API to be, then drop it in the chat. That's what I'm is what I'm saying. Or I will. I sure will. Okay. I'll say. Uh, I'll drop it in and see what happens. I'll see what I come up with first. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Okay. Hope, uh, I hope you come up with something good, <laughs> whether I'm part of it or not. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye. Thanks. All right, well, that's it. Uh, let me take a time code for a wrap up. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us for this CircuitPython weekly meeting. Uh, reminder before I forget, uh, next week is not on Monday. Next week is on Tuesday. Uh, big r flashing red lights. Um, next week is not on Monday. Next week is not on Monday. Memorial Day. Yeah, Memorial <laughs> Day here in the US. So we will be uh, pushing it a day later. And I'm trying to find my my notes. Uh, so this has been the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting. Thank you to everyone who participated. Uh, Charles, can you mute, please? Um, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those of us that work on CircuitPython who are paid by Adafruit, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held uh, next Monday. Or, well, uh, sorry, I'm auto-reading this. That is not true. It's lies. Uh, the next meeting will be held next Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific uh, here on the Adafruit Discord server. Uh, you can join the Discord server by going to adafru.it slash discord. Uh, to be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. And with that, uh, thank you everybody for hanging out. It's wonderful to hear all the cool stuff you're doing. And we'll see you next week on Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you all. And uh, have a great uh, weekend and week on the Discords. And uh, for those of you in the U.S., I hope you have a good long holiday weekend as well. Uh, thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.